Okay, well, welcome to another episode of Insight Insights. My name is Erin Grace, and I uh, run communications for the National Counterterrorism Innovation Technology and Education Center based at the University of Nebraska at Omaha. And I'm excited today to uh, have Dr. Amira Jadun with us. She is an assistant professor of political science at Clemson University. She also came to UNO last year to talk about her new book, which was then new, it's almost a year old, um, which was on the Islamic State Khorasan, so ISK, which we'll be talking about uh, today. Um, she has been in high demand since Friday, March 22nd, when um, uh, ISIS-K or ISK um, is said to have killed a over 130 Russians, uh, injured 100 more in a terrible attack on a theater outside Moscow. Um, <clears throat> of course, uh, ISK has claimed responsibility. The United States has basically affirmed that. Uh, Russia, however, uh, to this date has not acknowledged that so much and they're pointing um, blame at Kiev. Uh, where there's no conflict of interest whatsoever since they had invaded uh, Ukraine. Ukraine has said um, they are not involved in this. And so here we are nearly a week after the attack. The U.S. had warned it might come. It did come. And so I think what we need to do is kind of make uh, sense of the, the landscape. And maybe let's just start with this threat actor, Dr. Jadun. Um, could you please tell us who ISK is and what we should call them? Um, and how they are alike or different than ISIS. Hey, um, thank you, Erin, and thank you to Insight for hosting me once again. It's always a pleasure to work with you all. Um, so ISK, Islamic State Khorasan, which is also referred to as ISIS-K or ISKP, the P standing for province, um, is the official affiliate of Islamic State, um, which emerged in around 2015 officially in the Afghanistan-Pakistan region. And so as an affiliate of ISIS, it shares similar goals and subscribes to the extreme Islamist ideology. Uh, we see some of the same brutal tactics. Um, overall, both groups support the establishment of a global caliphate. They target state and civilian actors while also instigating sectarian warfare. However, when we look at ISK, because it's based in the Afghanistan-Pakistan region, it combines these global objectives of Islamic State with a focus on local dynamics, conflict dynamics, which are specific to South and Central Asian region. Um, so overall, while ISK is aligned with the main group's overarching global jihadist narrative, when we look at its strategy, its operations, its tactics, including its recruitment, these are fundamentally shaped by regional political developments, um, and different types of conflicts which already exist in the region. So some of the ways that we have seen ISK localize its jihad and its brand while still retaining that global brand um, is by recruiting locally and collaborating with like-minded militant factions which are already present in the region. So in, in our book, we talk about its close alliances with lashkar Jangwi, which is a well-known sectarian group which has existed in the Afghanistan-Pakistan region um, for several years. And similarly, when we look at the grievances in ISK's propaganda, its outreach campaigns, you see commentary on local social economic, uh, socioeconomic issues, and you see a very sophisticated audience segmentation where you can see that they're trying to appeal to the grievances of um, its Indian members, Chinese members, Tajik and Uzbek militants. So in recent years, especially since the withdrawal of the US, the takeover of the Taliban and the collapse of the Afghan government, we've seen it launched a very um, aggressive multilingual propaganda campaign covering a whole host of local languages. And again, we see social commentary within its propaganda, which really speaks to current issues. Um, for example, something that the Indian government said or something that the Pakistani government is doing um, in order to appeal and stay relevant to its local audience. So even though ISK's overarching global agenda aligns with its parent organization, it has really adapted its approach to fit the local dynamics. All politics being local, of course, um, that makes a lot of sense to me. Is it more powerful than ISIS? I think of ISIS as yesterday's news. 
So I think since ISIS lost its territorial control and it experienced intense losses due to several U.S.-led operations in Iraq and Syria, since then, its strategy has more been to project its power through its affiliates around the world. And we saw al-Qaeda do the same when al-Qaeda central became weak. So this is one main advantage of having a franchise model, if you will, whereby even when IS central or al-Qaeda central, when they lose power and influence, they are still able to project power through their affiliates. Okay, and so I think the question on everyone's mind, Dr. Jadoon, after this happened, or I, I should say on Westerners' mind, is if they could do an attack so far outside their territory um, in a secured state, you would think, what should Europe expect? What should the United States expect about I ISK's ability to reach far for attacks? Right, so I think right now we can take a breath and be confident in some of the really robust counterterrorism infrastructure that Western governments have developed over the past two decades, I would say. So the U.S. being a leader since 9-11, but also a lot of European governments have not only just put in counterterrorism um, protocols, but also they have, you know, um, launched several counter violence and prevention um, strategies. So on the whole, I think um, it's prudent for Western governments to remain vi vigilant about the threat because we don't want there to be a failure uh, of imagination, right? So having said that, I think the immediate threat from ISK is A, within Afghanistan and Pakistan, but also B, in the immediate surrounding region, right? Which could include attacks on Western interests or Western presence within the region, such as embassies or where their citizens uh, may be found or believed to be located. So in terms of the immediate region, um, I think ISK's expanding influence and its ability to reach diverse audiences in the region is, is a big risk. And this is closely tied to what has happened in the Afghanistan context, right? So in one way, its strategic environment has shifted profoundly with the US military and NATO operations um, no longer being there or exerting pressure on the group. So this has naturally given ISK a lot more opportunity to exploit, but also to slowly regroup um, and, and just operate with more leeway. On the other hand, we also have the Taliban government, which many believed is capable of constraining terrorist groups. Um, but I, I just can't buy that because the Taliban for an insurgent group, not really a governing entity, and they have many other demands, which typical state actors do, um, except for they are less prepared to handle those. So they may be good at taking out some top leaders and claiming that as wins, but whether that is sustainable, that's, you know, I mean, I think we're seeing the outcome of that right now. Um, another important factor, I think, which is tied to this growing ISK threat is how the militant landscape has shifted. So in prior years, when the Taliban insurgency was in place, um, a lot of other militant groups sort of um, aligned themselves with this central Taliban force and drew their legitimacy um, from that group and used it in some ways to sustain their own movements. Now, with the Taliban gone and uh, in terms of being an insurgent group, and trying to distance themselves from militant groups, um, all of these other militant factions still need an umbrella group. And ISK has really stepped in to fill this vacuum. Um, and additionally, Al-Qaeda, while it may be rebuilding slowly, its reputation is really subdued. So again, that benefits ISK. Now, coming back to the threat to Western governments, um, the risk there is that is the appeal of the IS brand. Right. And if Islamic State and Islamic State Khorasan specifically tries to mobilize potential sympathizers, sympathizers who are already based in Western countries, um, sort of encouraging them to undertake attacks wherever they are, I think that's the risk to Western governments. So I think it's important then for Western governments to sort of remain on top of monitoring uh, what's happening in the online environment. Um, and how these individuals may try to connect with sympathizers, potential sympathizers overseas. 
Uh, that's a great example. I remember w when that happened in ISIS, I believe, was the San Bernardino shooting, an outcome of that, I think, Exactly. a call to arms. So, uh, so that is really, um, really interesting. I mean, I was going to ask you, what, what does counterterrorism look like after an attack such as this? I mean, Russia, um, you know, their security forces sort of paraded the suspects in front of cameras to show, like, we're not going to mess around with these guys. And, and in fact, to have some flagrant maybe abuses of Geneva Conventions. Is that any kind of deterrent? Or, you know, to this uh, kind of attack, or will that not matter to ISK? Or what Right. response does Russia, what do they do? Yeah, no, I think that's a great question, right? And uh, I will argue that I think torturing arrested attackers is not an effective way of containing or deterring ISK. If anything, I would say that this creates fresh material for Islamic State to exploit within its propaganda, and it helps them justify the vilification of state actors like Russia. So it's essentially playing into their hands, right? And we know that terrorist groups will intentionally provoke government actors, um, hoping for an excessive response, which then legitimizes their extreme narratives. I mean, we, we already know this, we've seen this, this is a strategy that terrorist groups adopt. So when states respond um, in such brutal ways, it doesn't really help deter because A lot of these individuals who are conducting these operations are really committed to the cause and know the risk. So I think to counter groups like ISK, uh, you know, we must promote regional counterterrorism cooperation and intelligence sharing. And that's especially important where when it comes to groups like ISK, because they operate as a network, right? And over the almost two decades of the war on terror, militant factions, especially which have existed in the Afghanistan, Pakistan region, have sort of realized that one way to withstand such intense counterterrorism operations is to network and collaborate, whether that's opportunistically or whether that's strategic in the long term. And we see this in the case of the Taliban, Lashkar Jangwi, all of these other groups which exist in the region. So to dismantle an actor, a terrorist actor, which operates as a network, we need different governments to work together. Because in the past, when one government cracks down on a single faction, it just reappears in another location, right? And this is especially true where borders tend to be porous, such as all of Afghanistan, primarily. Um, so I think cooperation, there's no way around it, and especially with intelligence sharing. Um, and I think kinetic operations, you know, should remain focused on taking out the top leaders because we have seen that that does constrain a group's activities, especially in the short term. And we're kind of seeing that with the Taliban when they started targeting ISK's top leaders, um, it did become constrained in its operations. But I would just also caution that that doesn't mean permanent degradation of the group. Um, and we need multiple other measures to make sure that the group stays constrained. Um, and, and alongside with groups like ISK or the Islamic State brand and even Al-Qaeda, I would say um, countering their narratives um, and taking actions which don't legitimize their extreme rhetoric um, will help weaken the appeal of such extreme ideologies. Thank you. That was really well said. Um, can you speak to the timing of this attack? I think about how the conversation has shifted away from terrorism and national security toward, you know, what is Russia doing, China? Certainly two wars have occupied everyone's attention uh, in this election season. So um, did, did, was it just an advantageous time for this attack? You know, yeah, I, I think so. I think the focus has shifted to great power competition, right? We're all focused on Russia, China, Iran, um, the US. But I think what we forget is that all of these major players will never engage or are unlikely to engage in direct warfare because it's too costly for them to wage war directly, which yeah. means that there are more opportunities or other types of conflicts like proxy warfare, Mm -hmm. is more likely. And when we have proxy warfare, that environment is conducive to terrorism. And so these conflicts, um, you know, the Israel and Hamas, the Ukraine conflict, um, 
I think these conflicts create an atmosphere which is even more conducive to militant factions operating non-state actors, some of which are linked to state actors. Um, and there's also more opportunities for financing for these individual groups. So I think, um, if anything, terrorism is more likely to take place, but within the context of either proxy warfare um, or conflicts which exist within states or between states. Um, were, was ISK, you mentioned um, Hamas and Israel, was ISK, uh, I mean, are there grievances, um, like you said earlier, localized, hyper-localized, or like the Houthis, are they inspired to uh, help Hamas, uh, or, is, or, or is that just a completely separate thing and we shouldn't? I, th I think we should treat that as um, a, a separate matter. But having said that, we see these groups still use these conflicts to justify their narratives, right? So if Israel um, engages in excessive retaliation, they will use that to justify their own attacks against various other actors. Um, and some of the regional actors, which are seen to be supporting countries like Israel or maybe have links with Russia, Again, so I think one of their, um, you know, most fierce component that they have in in this warfare, you know, asymmetrical warfare or terrorism, um, is exploiting um, such incidents to justify their narratives and their ideology um, is really enduring. So I think this is one of the um, advantages that they have as non-state actors. Um, I guess it, it, sort of in closing, there's so much we could talk about, but uh, I want to ask what other groups are we not paying attention to that we should be thinking about in addition to ISK? Yeah, so I mean, the different actors which, you know, come to my mind are, we're concerned about, we've been concerned about ISIS, you know, in, in the Middle East, but um, it has a lot of affiliates right around the world. And if we just look at the South Central Asian context, ISK is its main affiliate, but there are other cells as well. There's also IS Pakistan. Um, there's also IS Hind, you know, which are less successful than ISK. But the threat there is um, that even at whatever capacity, if they start collaborating, um, then it's really difficult for governments to tackle that networked approach, right? And it's the same thing with Al-Qaeda and, for example, its various affiliates um, in Africa and Yemen, um, AQIS, and the Indian subcontinent. Um, these groups are um, intertwined in the local environment. So they pose real threats and they can fluctuate in their um, capacity. Now, I think one thing that Western governments sort of tend to put in a box and put it aside uh, is when groups like the Pakistani Taliban or the BLA, the Baloch Liberation Army, um, when these groups are targeting local governments. So they're not an immediate threat or a direct threat to Western countries. But I think what's important to keep in mind is that the governments which are dealing with these groups, um, the US, for example, often relies on them uh, for their capacity to constrain some of these other groups, which are linked to local groups, which may be a threat to the US, right? So if these governments are so drained um, and focused on groups like the TTP, the BLA, um, then that makes them take their eye off other groups which are a direct threat to the U.S. Um, and I think relatedly, um, homegrown extremism and violent extremism um, has increasingly, at least in when it comes to Islamist ideologies, um, it's not just a domestic concern for Western governments because it kind of intersects with international threats, right? So many Western governments are grappling with the challenge of individuals becoming increasingly radicalized by these international terrorist ideologies, which are often propagated in online platforms or environments. So understanding which groups pose the greatest threat in terms of their ability to mobilize supporters um, from afar is also pretty important. Um, and additionally, I mean, you have the Iran Threat Network, which is present in different parts of the world, and they collaborate, again, with local actors, um, just creating a lot of blurry lines. Um, so I think being attentive to what is happening 
within these domestic environments overseas is pretty important as well because they can affect actors based in Western governments. That's just great. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, boy, is there anything you would like to add that we haven't really covered here? Um, I guess I would just like to say that, um, you know, uh, when ISIS-K, ISKP or ISK, when they launch an attack on Iran and now in Russia, um, all of a sudden we start paying attention to this threat, right? Um, but I think it's important to sort of keep an eye on especially the messages they're putting out there. Um, and their underlying sources of strength. So in, in the case of ISK, every time it's constrained, we have declared it defeated so many times. The U.S. has, Pakistan has, Afghanistan, and now the Taliban, right? Uh, and then we're surprised that, oh, they weren't launching any attacks, but how come, you know, now we're seeing an attack in Iran and Russia? Um, and I keep going back to the fact that, yes, when you target top leaders, it does constrain the group. We have a lot of empirical evidence about that, but it doesn't necessarily dismantle um, the group. These are just short-term gains. So we should be thinking about what happens beyond those short-term gains. So what do we need uh, to build environments and also societies uh, which are resilient to the reoccurrence and reemergence of such groups? Because as long as they have their recruitment pipelines in place, um, they can tap into uh, a jihadist infrastructure to rebuild. We're going to keep seeing these problems again and again. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to thank you for your time today. Uh, I'm holding myself back because I have a lot of other things to ask you, but just in the interest of time, we'll save that for another time. For those of you uh, who are watching or listening, please uh, pick up a copy of Dr. Jadun's book that she co-wrote with Andrew Mines. It is called The Islamic State in Afghanistan and Pakistan, Strategic Alliances and Rivalries. And it was relevant last year and even more so, unfortunately, right now for the reasons that you just said. Um, so thank you again, um, Dr. Jadun. Thank you, Erin. Thank you for having me.